Good morning, everyone. And uh, people are continuing to come into the, uh, the webinar. So uh, I'll, I'll speak slowly. Um, this is the seventh Studiosity webinar for the year. And today's webinar is on academic integrity law, what it means for universities, students and faculties. Clearly, this has been uh, of great interest to everyone because there are over 700 people that have um, registered for the, uh, for the webinar. But before we get, begin, I want to acknowledge that I'm hosting this online conversation from the lands of the Camaragal people. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which all of you work today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this meeting. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. I also want to acknowledge the significant contribution made by Professor Tracy Breitag from the University of South Australia. We're all saddened to hear of her untimely death. Her work has shaped our understanding of academic integrity and through her commitment, insight and courage and integrity is at the forefront of academic life. She will be greatly missed. You're joining a conversation today hosted by Studiosity where we've put together a panel of experts to examine the application and impact of the recently gazetted legislation on contract cheating. Academic integrity is everyone's responsibility and multiple stakeholders have a role to play in its enactment and compliance. Our panel represents members of these stakeholders. Our panel comprises of Professor Jane Den Hollander, former Vice-Chancellor of Deakin University and also Interim Vice-Chancellor from the University of Western Australia from February to July of this year. Dr Guy Curtis, Senior Lecturer in Applied Psychology at the University of West, Western Australia and a spokesperson for Texas 2019 Academic Integrity Workshop Tour of Australia and New Zealand. Mr. Greg Simmons, Director of Policy and Analysis for TEXA. And finally, Steve Erskine, Director of Higher Education Systems Design and Quality, the Australian Government Department of Education, Skills and Employment. So our session is organized around a five minute introduction, which I'm nearly through. Um, and I will ask each member of the panel, of the panel questions that relate to their area of expertise and area of jurisdiction. That'll be about 35 minutes. Then we'll have questions taken from the audience and I will, I will try to bring it together. But before um, we begin, can I just um, encourage people to stay until the end because we have a, an important announcement to be made by the chairman of Studiosity. So please try to stay uh, until two o'clock our time. But I think before um, asking the questions, the context of the legislation is really important and I'm sure some of the speakers will also develop that. The government has passed legislation that makes it an offence to provide or advertise academic cheating services in higher education, often referred to in higher education circles as contract cheating. The new law is aimed at those people who provide and advertise cheating services and not at students. Students who cheat will continue to be subject to the institution's own academic integrity process policies, processes, and academic sanctions. The new law does not affect these institutional policies. TEXA will administer the new law, uh, including taking out injunctions to block overseas cheating websites and pursuing prosecutions, intelligence gathering, and an educative role to help providers develop a prevention strategy. So let me um, start then with a question to Stephen. Uh, what challenges do you anticipate in the implementation and oversight of the legislation, Steve? And what will success look like? And what advice would you give regarding responsibilities to the stakeholders who've listened to the webinar? Thanks very much, Judith, and thanks for the welcome to country. Um, I think the, uh, it's important to understand the genesis of uh, the legislation. So this came about as a response uh, initially to the 2014 My Master contract cheating incident and subsequent advice from both TEXA and from the Higher Education Standards Panel um, indicated that a legislative uh, response was needed to, to better support uh, the sector's response to these issues. So the key outcome that we're looking for from this legislation is deterrence, which drives some aspects of the legislation like the scale of penalties, et cetera. 
And what we're trying to do here is to change the incentives for the provision of academic cheating services and to reduce the opportunity to access those cheating services. You mentioned the website blocking as a, as a particular focus there. But also, I think, to change the narrative around uh, some of these issues so that from now on, helping a, a higher education student to cheat is not just unethical, it's also illegal and backed by significant penalties. So that's quite a significant shift, I think, for, uh, for the sector, but also for uh, people engaged in these services to understand. Um, I think um, the, the biggest challenge will be uh, getting uh, awareness amongst cheating service providers that uh, things have changed. So I think there'll be quite a bit of effort there for Texa and others to, to ensure that the perpetrators of these um, activities are fully aware of their potential liabilities. And those liabilities cross international boundaries. It's not just services from within Australia that are, are now illegal, it's services to any Australian higher education student from anywhere. Um, and I guess also for uh, students and others in the sector to understand uh, the nature of the law and how they how, how they might need to interact with that law. Can I just ask a follow up question? Why now for the legislation? Well, I guess well as as I mentioned, th th we've been working on this for some time since around about 2014 when the My Master um, scandal kind of hit very publicly. But uh, you know we're aware through through anecdotal evidence, but also evidence from research uh, from Tracy and others that uh, there's been an explosion in in the promotion of these cheating services on campuses in recent years. You know students are being bombarded with uh, material promoting, sort of downplaying the the um, the moral ethical uh, issues involved and uh, sort of presenting it as being cheap, easy to access, and and um, consequence free. And really what this legislation is trying to do is, as I said, change that narrative quite significantly. Okay, thank you. If we could uh, move across to Greg, um, this legislation will give um, Texas some teeth, uh, something that it previously didn't have in many people's eyes. Um, how will you identify the perpetrators of contract cheating? And what will you have put in place to achieve this task? Thanks, Judith. Um... So I might start by saying that I see this legislation as um, an important component of how um, we as government and the sector together will address this particular issue. But it's just it's one aspect um, of a very complex, you know, the, the, the toolkit that we might use to combat a very complex problem. Um, I think first and foremost, what, this, um, what these powers do is send a very strong signal to people who engage in this activity, either as consumers or as um, people proffering a service, um, that this uh, activity is illegal and uh, therefore deemed in this country to be something that isn't acceptable. Um, in terms of how we will go about executing these powers, um, the simple answer is we'll do it carefully. Um, we'll do it in a considered fashion and um, we will do it by establishing and building capacity around our intelligence gathering. We'll do it working with people in the sector um, through establishing communities of practice and clear protocols for um, uh, passing on that intelligence to us. Um, and then um, once we receive information and um, identify if you like, uh, likely candidates for um, applying this legislation, we need to ensure that our internal processes have been developed such that we can put together a really solid case to a federal court to ensure that um, the sites can be either blocked or the services can be prosecuted. So recently, the federal government also made an announcement um, of the establishment of a higher education integrity unit at TEXA. Um, what that does for TEXA is it brings some much needed funds, which we will use to ensure that we have an appropriate staffed unit and will actually establish the internal capacity to be able to take advantage of these powers. And what can universities expect of TEXA? 
nothing more than what universities already expect from TEXA, that we will work together with providers across the sector to deal with the problems that we face. So a very open and partnership oriented approach to regulation. We appreciate that we're part of the picture, we're not the whole picture, um, and that providers themselves um, have varying degrees of maturity in how they deal with this particular issue. So we think there's a place for TEXA to help um, perhaps encourage conversations across the sector, encourage information sharing and sharing of good practice, and to, to be a bit of a, a, an honest broker in this area. So um, in the past, providers might not have necessarily wanted to approach other providers and establish um, a coordinated approach to topics like this. Um, TEXA um, and uh, the profile that TEXA has received through these powers and the integrity unit allows us to establish a network where that information can be shared across the sector far more readily. And my final question that, um, will the perpetrators be made public? Well, um, be, yeah, uh, the decisions will be public, right. Judith. Um, so there's, there's um, and they will be reported on and, and that will assist in, in um, promoting this particular initiative, yeah. much like um, copyright cases are reported on. Okay, thank you. Jane, um, across to you now. Um, within the context of a university, what's your response to this legislation? Thank you, Judith, and thanks for the invitation to be here. Um, so my first point is that, you know, cheating has been around since Adam was a boy. And there is a lot of evidence in our community that threats don't actually stop people breaking the law. Putting that aside and saying, what should a vice chancellor, what should an executive, what should an academic teacher do? We need to think about the student experience. So we know that our graduation certificate says certain things about learning outcomes. It's our duty to make sure that those learning outcomes have been validly and sensibly gained through the process. So for me, this legislation gives better focus to the hard edge of what student experience is. It's not about having fun and doing all those social things on the campus, that matters. But the student experience is about how are you properly admitted to the university? How are you given the information you needed to make, make the best that you can of your learning outcomes? And doing that involves then this whole piece on integrity. My second point is about the weaponization of cheating. You know, in the good old days, we were talking about them earlier, a supervisor in the room would spot in two seconds who had written whatever on their leg, on their slide rule, or on a grotty piece of paper that they had stuck to their arm. These days, it's a different matter altogether, and it goes to these big businesses. I have some question about whether these businesses will be frightened by, by any of this, we shall see. But how we educate our students about what is the right thing and that learning outcomes are to be earned and not paid for is, is quite a significant question. And so now I go to the core of the matter, which is our staff. Our academic staff in our sector, you know, I've, I've been quite vocal of late. One of my biggest regrets was I didn't take a bigger stand in my time against casualization. We need to give staff time to be trained, to learn how to do assessment properly. Deacon, I've noticed there's a lot of Deacon people here, Cradle, you would all know about Cradle and the work that they're doing. And I think doing some of that work to enable all of us who teach and assess how to do assessment in ways that is not duplicated, that can't be easily um, done by somebody in four hours in an 800 essay or something like that. And I think that's where the heart of the matter is. We have a duty now as universities to make sure that our staff are enabled to do assessment in ways that helps them and more importantly, enable students to demonstrate their learning outcomes. Um, there's lots of things around. I'm not sure that we can do this all on our own. I've been talking a lot as a consequence of this invitation. I had a great conversation with Cadmus the other day, another platform that looks at how do you design assessment to future proof it to make sure that it's not hackable or or destroyed in some way. We need to start using some of those sorts of cleverness to help um, with our sides. What Texa does with, with, with people who cheat is a business for them. Our business is to ensure our teachers, our students understand what integrity is 
and how important it is. And there's not a lot of role models in the world at the moment. Let's, let's put that point if you just look at the Australian situation. And then we need to help our staff learn to do assessment in ways that are 21st century proofed. Um, so the students can leave knowing that everyone around them who's graduating has been just like them. They've worked really hard. They've understood their learning outcomes and they deserve what they're getting. Um, and so my last point is if we do nothing, the fear and the irritation that happens in communities when they know someone's cheated to get that high distinction is one of the most corrosive things that we deal with often in classrooms. My final point is in universities, we should also advertise when we find people who have been, who have cheated, particularly in these large scale things, and we should name and shame because that's the best way to learn that there's no fun in this and there's no gain. So Jane, you also indicated that um, people need training. Mm -hmm. um, so given at the moment, um, industrial uh, um, agreements don't necessarily have training as part of the industrial agreement. How can you make that an integral part of, of an academic's work so that in fact, academic integrity becomes a central part of an institution's uh, culture and the way it operates both internally and externally. Yeah, I think that that's the big dilemma we have, you know, in, a, in, a, in an, a, an industry which is on declining revenue, greater numbers, all sorts of, all sorts of pressures. I mean, there is so much legislation that we now deal with just to put that aside. So it is an issue, but I think it's unfair to have a casual, contracted, clever person, an, someone who has an academic career, who has academic qualifications, to put them in front of a, a classroom and say, and design some assessment. In the big units where you have assessment teams, it's simpler. But to do that properly, it seems to be now that we need to be finding ways to assess how people work, multiple choice. And you know, I remember when you'd set exams, you'd set the exam for the class, you'd be able to pick the classes were small, it was easier. It's been weaponized now. And so we now do need to have staff who have a better understanding of how to do scenario assessment, how to vary one aspect of it. Um, I'm not an expert in this area at all, but I do know that some of the simplistic ways we do our assessment are not going to withstand those people, that 10%, who are always going to cheat and how we then make it harder for them to cheat. I think making it harder for, for cheats rather than trying to catch the cheats is the way to go and bring those numbers down. Because we need to operate for the 99% or the 95% who are there genuinely wanting to learn, taking that learning, and you know, it is the experience of their life. Um, so that's where I come from. I think I, our, our agreements, we need to talk to the union um, or the unions and um, have some discussion about how we do do some of these things. I think most academic staff would love to have some time to look at these things and to do it in a considered way. Phil Dawson's online somewhere here, I saw his name. Ask Phil Dawson what he thinks about how we would do this. Go to the experts. We have a lot of experts in our sector, huge numbers who've spent their life looking at this. Let's listen to them for once. So Greg, you've been listening to Jane's response. And you talked about uh, the need for partnership. Yep. What, what role would TEXA have in helping to uh, enable and facilitate some of those ideas that Jane presented? I think in, in a couple of different ways, Judith. First and foremost, there's a lot of great work happening um, across Australia. We're very dedicated, passionate and driven researchers um, who are doing their best to um, think of innovative ways to address this particular issue. I just wonder how many providers um, have on their risk register reputational risk, I think most. Underneath that, I wonder whether um, one of the issues that contributes to reputational risk that is overseen by councils um, is academic integrity. Um, and so I think another way that TEXA can assist is just bringing um, this issue prominently to the table and, and looking for uh, a bit of institutional responsibility at the top to support some of the people at the bottom who are working so hard. Um, and so 
So part of that is around facilitating discussions with the providers we, we talk to, um, talking about how, uh, how significant we see the issue is. And I think it is a significant issue. I think in many ways, it's a tip of the iceberg issue for us at the moment. Part of it is around um, giving a voice and giving a, a mechanism to help disseminate a lot of the good work and promote it so that people can more readily adopt it. Um, so, so that's some simple ways I think you know, throughout the course of our regular work and through working together with the sector and engaging them on the things that we see are important and understanding how, you, how the sector themselves are addressing this, um, we can actually uh, assist in this way. And Steve, continuing on the, the idea of partnership, what's, what's the role of, of the government in terms of the partnership between the three, the various stakeholders, both public, public universities, but also um, private providers? Well, I guess one, one of the, uh, the main things we will do is look at the impact of this legislation over time. Um, there's also a body called the Higher Education Standards Panel, which has a focus on quality of delivery and um, you know, a whole range of issues related to the higher education standards. But it, it will be a point of interest for them also in terms of what the impact of this legislation has been. So once uh, we've got a bit of experience of uh, seeing how Texas is working with the sector and how the sector is responding, no doubt we'll be looking at whether there's um, additional effort that's required or uh, you know, changes in approach, those sorts of things. Um, it's hard to predict at this point in time exactly uh, what uh, might be needed in that regard, but our focus so far has been getting the legislation through Parliament, which, you know, gladly we were successful in doing. Mm -hmm. Guy, you're across to you. The acceptance of this legislation can be seen as an inflection point for the practice and responsibility of academic integrity. How can we use this as a teachable moment for students, and what should universities focus on during the initial stages of implementation? Thanks, Judith. So, uh, as a teachable moment for students, I think it's uh, just really important that what this legislation shows is uh, the national priorities around academic integrity, that um, not just uh, academics, as we always have, treat um, performing with integrity in students' work seriously, but uh, this is something that's recognised by the government uh, as something that's, that's very important. And there's lots of things universities can do uh, to uh, act in ways that dovetail really nicely with this legislation and are consistent with it. Uh, and things that universities can do uh, beyond uh, the legislation to deal with some of the issues of academic integrity that this legislation doesn't cover. So just um, to, to take uh, by way of example, um, Stephen mentioned that uh, the My Master's scandal was around about 2014, and we're now at uh, 2020, six years later, and we have legislation. And I think, sadly, one of the things that it does show is that the wheels of government can be a little bit slow in making things happen. Um, similarly, uh, for people who are aware of it, the government does have the ability to block um, torrenting and pirating sites for things like videos and music and so on. Uh, and that's been in existence for a while, but it's only taken um, until quite recently for some of those sites to be blocked at an internet service provider level. So universities have the ability to be a bit more nimble than that. Um, universities can, with their own IT, uh, do things such as uh, block sites on their own um, university servers and university logins. And I can say here at the University of Western Australia, we have quite a number of um, sites that are, we've identified as potentially problematic um, sites offering contract cheating services to students blocked. And we can see uh, with our um, internal uh, information, how many students are accessing or attempting to access it, where they're accessing it from, um, these sorts of things. And sometimes students are just stumbling across these sites when they're looking for educational help and educational support and essay help and things like that. And simply the fact that they don't get there when they're on a university computer is something that um, may stop some students actually using those services. When you look at the research that um, was published by Tracy Bretag and her colleagues a couple of years ago on uh, a really large survey of contract cheating in Australia, she found, uh, they found, I should say, uh, three main predictors of um, engagement in contract cheating. And one of those was 
the perceptions that there are opportunities. And the less students are able to get to these sites, the less perception that there will be that there are opportunities. So the legislation is doing that um, in some respects. But of course, universities themselves can also be reporting these sites to Texta to get the wheels in motion for, for Texta to engage their powers to, to block. But the other things uh, that universities can do, uh, for, you know, some have already been mentioned by people like Jane, uh, allow our staff time to actually uh, look at the uh, work that they're uh, assessing and marking such that they can take cases of academic integrity problems forward and things that Greg has mentioned, such as the support that techs are give uh, to the sector, not just in uh, supporting this legislation, but the information that's out there. So uh, there's a lot of information, for example, on academic integrity assessment, um, contract cheating available through the, the Texas site that gives universities and staff real practical instructions on what to do. So we, we, we talked about partnerships with one of the other stakeholders. How can students be part of the partnership so that they are they help to resolve and provide solutions to this problem? Because once again, it's cultural and it's, you know, the quality of their degree uh, d will be diminished if it's seen to be, uh, if there are, there's a lack of academic integrity. Yeah, that, that's a, a fantastic point that, that students and staff and universities can partner together in this. This isn't something uh, that uh, should entirely be the responsibility of university academics and administrators. Um, students are really um, sold on the importance of the quality and the reputation of their own degrees. Students know that it's important that their degree means something and it shows their learning and they're willing to be involved in activities that support academic integrity. So we see some really great examples from across Australia that um, we saw on the academic integrity uh, workshops project that I was involved in. And uh, we have some examples in the, the Texas Academic Integrity Toolkit of partnering with students where students have gone into promotional activities uh, that are really um, important. So today being the 21st of uh, October, uh, it's the International Day of Action Against Contract Cheating and some university students have been um, out on campus or you know, maybe less so in the coronavirus pandemic, but um, certainly in previous years they've you know, had stalls set up. Um, I think it's Deakin, I'll give a little shout out to Deakin where they had a spinner wheel, what's the consequence of getting caught for um, in being involved in cheating, a uh, thing that students could um, take their chances on. So there's lots of things that students can do. Um, with staff and it'd be great for, for staff to encourage students to be involved in that. Look, I just want to read a, uh, a comment by Tom Worthington. Oh God, uh, the, the thing keeps moving. So I'm, I'm getting a bit of motion sickness here. Uh, we should not set out to shame students ever. We should have small assessment tasks early to identify those who need assistance and to have propensity to cheat. We can then help those willing to work harder and make it clear to those who are not that they are never going to pass. I, I've been doing this with some, some online courses for 10 years and it works fine. Any comments that people would like to make to that, um, that comment made by Tom? While my mic is, is still on before anyone else has a chance to unmute, um, I just quickly say that um, I, I do a bit of work on um, contract cheating and academic integrity research with a, a collaborator and colleague who's a criminologist and um, his Point of view is that uh, shaming people um, for crimes uh, is not a good way to um, address crime, at least as the research shows. And that, and the extent to which uh, breaking the rules could be considered a crime like behaviour, then shaming um, individual people uh, may not, in fact, be the best um, or most effective thing that we can do. Okay, look, yeah. go on. Judith, I would mind a point there quickly. I agree. Uh, um, Student unions, I think, do want to have a bigger say in some of this. One of the things that I found upset students the most was knowing that there was someone in the class who had plagiarised or had cheated in some way and was getting away with it. Now, they're not all young 19-year-olds who are unthinking through. So 
What we can't do is turn a blind eye. So if there's a mass cheating incident, for example, name a discipline, engineering was one I was involved in where 20 students were knocked off. We made a big deal of saying 20 students were knocked off. We didn't say Jonathan Smith and Jennifer Brown were knocked off. We actually said, here's what happened. Oh, Bernie Marshall's just come on. He could tell you the whole story. Um, these are important things to get out there. I don't think that legislation deters anyone if they genuinely are pressured or otherwise predisposed to be dishonest. But it does make it aware for everyone else how hard it is and perhaps um, stop some people doing it. People still steal and do terrible things in our community. Look at it every day. We need to educate our students. But more than that, we need to educate our staff to make it harder for them to, to go down these slippery paths and where it appears to be easy. But I wouldn't stay silent on the number of people cheating in the university. My final point is every council in this, every university council in Australia worries about the public relations disaster of a mass cheating incident. It's number one, two or three on their list. So there's a question here from uh, Professor Chris Tisdell from uh, Uni University of New South Wales. With COVID-19, most of my students are offshore in places like India and China where TEXA legislation might not apply. Can you suggest some strategies uh, regarding academic integrity in these situations? And perhaps Greg might start off. Let me start off by saying that TEXA legislation would apply and does apply uh, as do the higher education standards framework uh, if an Australian qualification is being offered offshore. So transnational students are covered by the TEXA Act and the higher education standards framework. Uh, with that being said, uh, I'd simply say that I don't believe the challenge is any um, any different to perhaps offering uh, education to students online uh, at the moment. Um, you still need to think about um, how your pedagogy is organised, how your assessment is designed, um, your academic culture, your, your processes and procedures around detection, around education and working with students to explain why it's not a good thing, um, what, how it affects them personally. Um, so all of the issues that have been discussed uh, today and have been discussed prior to today by all the people who are participating um, equally apply to students who are studying abroad with an Australian provider um, to try to um, procure an Australian degree. So we've got a, a question here from a colleague from the Auckland Institute of Studies and um, this question is, my question relates to the, the academic integrity challenges in the commercial private tertiary education providers community and the copyright restrictions that are different from government owned organizations. So the question is, I've been dealing with uh, copyright challenges our staff and students are facing uh, parallel to the lack of resources. I'd like to hear if there are any panelists who've had any similar experiences or any evidence that they can provide um, to uh, support the things that he's saying. So it, it is about the private providers. So how do you manage private providers? I think you manage private providers the way you manage public providers, quite frankly. Um, uh, copyright, I think, is a, is a separate issue to academic integrity. Um, it, you know, you can get, get caught up with issues of plagiarism, I guess, um, that might have some copyright uh, implications. I don't profess to be an expert on copyright law. It's quite a complex space, um, but there are certain provisions under copyright law for fair use um, that most providers are able to take advantage of. Um, but uh, I'd simply say that uh, I think regardless of whether you have a, a public, private, large or small institution, um, you have um, uh, a responsibility to consider how you might effectively uh, deliver uh, qualifications in a way that protects the integrity of those qualifications and therefore has some value for the graduating students attached to those awards. Um, and uh, in many ways, smaller providers can be a lot more nimble than larger providers. So there's some opportunities there for smaller providers as well. And back, uh, another one for you, Greg. Um, this person asks, when uh, will we find out how to report cheating services to TEXA? Uh, is it expected that institutions will need to take uh, a role 
um, in doing this or can individuals do it? Uh, individuals can do it, whether they be students, staff members or members of the public uh, and institutions can do it as well. No one is required to do it um, under our act um, unless uh, the higher education standards are being um, at risk or breached and then there's a material change responsibility on providers. Um, but we would certainly encourage anyone to get in contact with TEXA to provide us information around um, organisations that are offering these services to people or promoting these services to people. Uh, and you can do that quite simply. You can go to the TEXA website and lodge a, um, what we call a concern uh, on our website. Um, you can do that anonymously if you choose, or you can identify yourself, or you can simply just email academic.integrity at texa.gov.au, and that will help us in our intelligence gathering. Okay, so, so you're collecting evidence, and then on the basis of that evidence, you uh, engage in interventions? That's, that's correct. Okay, so we've got somebody... Judith? Yes. Yeah, I noticed there was a question in the um, the chat room earlier on about uh, information sharing and the extent to which that's possible. So there were specific changes in the, the law that was passed around uh, these measures that provide authority for people to provide information to TEXA about cheating services and also for TEXA to share that information with institutions that might be affected where there's evidence that um, the but the specific institution is affected by the, the information that they've got. So there are additional information sharing powers as part of this law that will help facilitate uh, the administration of the new law. Yeah, and, and Guy talked about whitelists at institutions earlier. Um, you know, we're aware that you know, providers have their own approaches to securing their network and discouraging the use of um, services such as this um, in, uh, across their network. Um, Texas needs to consider before it shares information about potential um, contract cheating sites that we've been able to demonstrate um, through our investigation that they're in fact um, offering contract cheating services. Some of them advertise in very clever ways. Um, so providers perhaps have a little bit more discretion in sharing those white lists. Um, and by establishing a community of practice, um, which is something that Texer is looking to do, we'll be able to assist you in forming those networks where you can actually share intelligence between yourselves, as well as sharing intelligence with Texer. So Jane, you've, you've probably been watching the, the questions as well um, and the comments. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, of our Deacon colleagues that are participating. What, what is it that's made Deacon so uh, sector leading in terms of the approach that they've taken, apart from the leadership of the former Vice-Chancellor? <laughs> Putting aside all of that, um, we digital first. We decided, you know, that we were going to be the premier university at the digital frontier. All our colleagues will now be beating their heads on the table. Um, and going digital, we, had, we grew fast. Mm -hmm. We had diversity in our classrooms. We made a deliberate attempt to be very diverse. You know, we did all of those things. But in the end, education for the jobs of your future, learning outcomes mattered. And Beverly Oliver, I don't know if Beverly's in here, but Beverly was a great DVCA who absolutely said, if we mean learning outcomes, we need to define them. We need to find ways to assess them. And we then need to find ways to to give the, the learning, get, get the learning the students need to enable that assessment and do it in smart ways. And the rest pretty much followed on from that. So it was a systematic approach to starting with the test aimer and working out how do you get a, a test aimer and graduate successfully? You have, to, you have to meet some learning outcomes. What are those learning outcomes? What are the assessments you put against that? And how does the teacher in the classroom help you learn to to establish for whoever it is that you are able to acquit yourself of that learning outcome. So it was very, I thought it was smart work and there's many of the people at Deakin, they're a smart team at Cradle, but there are lots of teams from there, but it was hard. I don't say everyone said, oh, wow, this is fabulous. There's a lot of complaints. Why are we doing research into these sorts of matters? when you know there's climate change and there's, there's other things on the horizon. So we committed the money. So it was expensive 
um, Judith, I have to say, and it took a lot of defense. At council, there was concern that were we exposing ourselves to be weak and that people came to Deacon to cheat? No, we were doing the opposite was to enable people. So not everyone was happy at the beginning. Everybody loves it now because it's successful. Keeping these sorts of people doing those jobs, I think is hard yakka and and as you know, and I think it's all very well to say to Texter, you can, you know, we, here's a bad company, go and close them down. You know the laws in most of the world. You can start up the next day just with a, a, a you know, full stop difference in your title. So how do we keep up with all of that? Is going to be you must go to the smarts. What are the learning? Is how do we give our students? the skills they need to know that they need to genuinely defend themselves against the learning outcomes and to do the hard work that a higher education requires. I think that's the thing we need to really um, be working on and looking at it in a structured way and keeping the community informed about why we do it that way. And we don't just go after cheats. We must go after cheats, but that's a separate thing. The 98% who are doing the right thing need to know that they've acquitted themselves well of their education. And I, don't, I can't stress that enough. I worry about that. And the final point is be nice to your staff because they're the front line in the classroom and we don't treat our cleverest and best as well as we could. Greg, what advice would you give to governing bodies about this legislation um, and to, to get to the point that Deacon has got to that Jane just described? Well, my starting point, I think, goes back to a comment I made earlier. Uh, I think this should be squarely on a provider's risk register as an issue. Uh, whether that's attached underneath reputational risk or not, you know, I'll leave that to providers to decide. But I think um, it, it's not something, we're not at a point where I think good governance um, would dictate that this is something that's not recognised um, and then has a plan on how you would address it. So everyone's going to address it differently. Everyone has unique operating contexts um, and providers are best placed to decide what will work for them. But I don't think an effective way of dealing with this problem is not actually recognising that it is a risk and an institutional risk. And if it's an institutional risk, what that means is you need to resource it. You need to resource how you will tackle it and how you will address it. And you'll need to support your staff in, a in tackling it. So I think it starts with first and foremost, recognising through your, your corporate and academic governance frameworks, that this is a risk, it's an institutional risk, it's a reputational risk, and there needs to be a plan for how you deal with it. Guy, a number of the, um, the comments here are talking about the development of communities of practice, the sharing of information, um, and the, the sharing of, of expertise. Could you give some advice to, um, to people who are co coordinating large programs about how they might establish or how they might get involved in a community of practice, really as, as, as part of the oversight and part of the cultural change about academic integrity being a core value of any institution. Sure, so um, I've seen comments in the uh, chat thread from Bernie Marshall, and he's mentioned an academic integrity uh, network uh, that's been set up in Australia already. That's uh, at this point, there's a, an email address uh, and a mailing list um, people may need to go back through the chat or they might want to get in contact with Bernie uh, directly. Uh, that mailing list um, I'm on, it's been a great source of information sharing around academics who are interested in academic integrity and professional staff who are interested in academic integrity, um, where we can kind of answer each other's questions, share resources and these sorts of things. It is, of course, not the only uh, source of community of practice of academic integrity. Lots of um, higher education focused uh, scholarship of learning and teaching um, sources, academic conferences have either um, subsections or workshops or um, series, of pre uh, series of presentations on academic integrity. Um, text is playing a role in the, the sharing of resources as well as the great uh, seminar series on online uh, teaching webinar series, I should say, that's been uh, put on the, uh, the Texas site this year. And um, in addition to that, there are academic integrity interest groups and networks uh, all around uh, the world. Um, and some of these, again, uh, you can find through the, the Texas Academic Integrity uh, Toolkit, which was, which was launched last week, uh, and people can, can sign up to those. There's no shortage of resources out there. Um, it's a matter of uh, just you know, seeking them out 
And one of the things that I find among researchers and uh, scholars who are interested in academic integrity is that um, they tend to be uh, very sharing people on information. We, they you know, will quite happily answer questions, are quite happily um, point you to resources and are quite happily give feedback. So anyone seeking information, there's definitely lots of interested people who are willing to help and share. Do any of the other panel members want to add anything to that comment by Guy? Just head nods, okay. So, um, but, what, what, yes. Do, what I would say is that institutions doing this, this is a Brand Australia issue. Brand Australia can get on top of this. Not only is it good for individuals, but it's good for us as a, as, as a nation, I think. And, you know, we're, we're 40 universities and how many private providers? We need to join on these things. We need to include TAFE. We need to also look at what people are doing in the upper years of high school um, and make it a, you know, integrity is important, especially in the 21st century. Here we are worrying about the great moral challenges of climate change and poverty. We should add integrity. If we were more integral, we'd worry about those other big things as well. But, or not, not integral, you know what I mean, if we were more honest and open about it. Yep. So there, there is a, a question that people are agreeing with things that you've said, Jane. Jane's been arguing, arguing the best way uh, to address cheating is improving the quality of teaching. A student who values scholarship and has the appropriate resources to learn never cheats. So how can we get all students to accept this, this proposition? Guy, I might start with you. Um, I'm not sure that uh, a student, even if well supported and properly resourced and, and taught perfectly will never cheat because um, there is you know, sadly some research from psychology and being a, being a psychologist that everyone, everyone, almost everyone will take a little advantage at a little time. Maybe not cheat seriously, but maybe cut a corner here and there. So being realistic, we can't get rid of um, all kinds of cheating in all circumstances, but what we can do is uh, reduce the chances and, and good educational practices really do, do that. Um, there's evidence from, again, the, the survey of contract cheating that Tracy Bretag led that satisfaction with the learning and teaching environment was uh, very important to um, reducing contract cheating or as a predictor of um, people not contract cheating if they were satisfied. And um, one of the things that we also see in the contract cheating uh, literature is that um, a lot of students who have engaged in contract cheating do it when uh, they run out of time or when they um, were sick and couldn't get an extension. So the kinds of support services that we need for, for students who need assistance need to be there. We need to be considerate of students' um, it needs and uh, the problems that they may face and help them through, give them the chance to get their assignments done um, on time or with extensions when they, they need them for, for valid reasons, um, rather than shutting the door in, in students' face if, even when they've got a sick note. Uh, so that kind of thing's really important. So we've, we've now got this, um, a whole lot of large corporate entities that are uh, providing services like Chegg and um, what, what's the one, Hero, something Hero. But um, there are a whole swap and credit websites to which students can upload notes, et cetera, for money or credits. Um, and uh, they include disclaimers to the effect that students must not use the website's resources in contravention of academic integrity standards. The same websites also advertise that they work with academic institutions to identify misuse of resources. Does this approach allow these websites to get around the new contract cheating regime? Greg, would you like to attempt that at first and then I'll open it up for other members of the panel? Well, it depends on how the sites are behaving. Um, so if, if the sites are behaving in a way that contravenes the law, then potentially they're caught by the law. Now, what that does is it means that Texan needs to think about its approach to investigating uh, or uh, assuring itself that those sites are indeed contravening the law. So there's a, um, a range of what I would call low hanging fruit or a lack of sophistication with some of these um, sites where it is quite apparent um, what they are advertising and what they are offering. Um, and they perhaps don't 
present the same challenges to TEXA around website blocking or potential prosecutions that some of the more sophisticated sites do. So, so I alluded to the fact that TEXA will need to develop its internal processes and its approach to investigating um, how these sites operate. And as part of that, we'll need to think about how we look under the covers around what is presented um, to the public via the web and what indeed is actually happening um, after those inquiries um, happen. Um, and the, those uh, entities engage with um, individuals uh, around their services. And thank you for the people who reminded me it was called Course Hero. Um, there's a comment here that a person's uh, made that uh, one of the most disappointing experiences they had was a person who was caught cheating in a professional ethics course. What's, what's behind that sort of behaviour? Guy, do you, want to, do you want to comment on that? Um, I've, I've had a, a similar experience of um, at one point being on a disciplinary panel at another university I worked at where a student had fabricated an email allowing them into a, a law course from a, a course coordinator. Um, the course coordinator had in fact sent an email saying, no, you cannot enrol in this, um, this law unit. And of course, that's um, really setting the, um, the standard low for, for legal ethics. Um, now, that kind of thing, why do, um, why do people cheat? Uh, it, it's a many and varied question. Um, the opportunity um, if presented to people to cheat, uh, not everyone will take. If um, there was a, the chance for students to buy an assignment, be guaranteed that they wouldn't be caught, um, and you ask students, would you do this? Uh, around half of students say no, even if I knew I wouldn't be caught. Um, because I would uh, do it just in order to learn. Um, beyond that, only a small proportion of students say that they would be likely to do it. Some say they might, but not many say that they'd even be likely to do that. So certainly um, in most cases, um, people tend to act ethically. And if you can um, do a thought experiment just briefly, if most people in society didn't act ethically most of the time, um, trust in many systems that we have would all break down. So most people do act ethically, uh, but sometimes um, people don't. And there are some individual differences psychologically that predict that people don't, um, such as personality traits like Machiavellianism, for example, but um, I, I won't go on at length about that kind of stuff. So Roger indicated that he surveyed his students in business ethics in year one and year three. And sadly he found by year three, their business ethics had declined. Yeah, exactly. So first of all, I mean, there's a couple of things I wouldn't mind saying, you know, we still assess, you know, on steroids, do, do we over assess? That's one of the, you know, I used to ask that all the time. Because one of the things that I think happens is that students get exhausted because there's, you know, if you've got 80% for three essays in a, in a, in a semester, what are you actually assessing? And it's the same thing, write me another 500 word essay. Of course, you're the third one, you're going to say, oh, I'm going to get 80% and you'll go and do it differently, maybe. I don't know. So that's a, I think we need to think about what is the purpose of assessment? Are there other ways of doing it? Are there experiential things? I don't know what the answers are to those things. But maybe there's too much assessment. The second thing, I think um, some of those standards go down because cheating goes by and people get disillusioned because if he's doing it, I'm going to do it. If she's doing it, why don't I take a bite of that as well? And I, I agree with you, Guy. I think there's something in, in our genetics of 70,000 years ago. That, you know, if we see a gap, um, it's a human instinct to maybe take it, which is a bad thing. And you have to almost train yourself against that. So you can't eradicate it altogether, I don't think, Judas. We're being delusional. What we have to do is work on the majority who genuinely are learning to be ethical, upright citizens and educate them well. Um, I don't think you're gonna to get to 99.995% of people who don't cheat, it's a waste of money. You'll never get there. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. And, and there've been a number of comments about people agreeing about the idea of assessment, but then that has issues around academic governance and quality standards. So it's, it's not an easy uh, issue or conundrum to resolve, but I think, as part of the community of practice, they, they're the sorts of questions and they're the sorts of um, issues that those communities of practice could at least start to uh, consider. Guy, have you got any comment about that? I need to go back to Tracy Bretag's work. You know, she was very smart on some of this. Yep. 
Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'll continue with other questions. Okay. G Greg, um, one of the questions was, uh, will you take on Fis Facebook? Because uh, that's a source <laughs> of um, where, where many of the, uh, these, these people do their, their advertising. I, I was just briefly um, coming into my mind the, the children's story, the little engine that could. There's Texo chugging up the, the hill to take on the mighty Facebook. Um, to, the simple answer to the question is we will engage with social media sites uh, around um, their um, facilitation of the advertising, uh, advertising these services. Um, how successful we are in engaging with them um, is something that we will need to work through and work through um, carefully. Uh, there's some international um, experience that would probably point to this being a bit of a, a challenge, um, but it is something that um, is um, on our to-do list. Uh, we've had our initial discussions with the Communications Alliance around the website blocking uh, aspects of our bill and how we will uh, go about doing that work. We are aware of Facebook uh, and Twitter um, posts that people use um, to um, promote their activities. Uh, and uh, we will be engaging um, as best we can with social media services to look at what we can do to discourage that activity. So in the couple of minutes that we've got left before I um, hand over to Jack, trying to pull what we've, we've said today is that the, the issue of academic integrity is actually one of the singular most confronting issues facing not only higher education, but I think um, our society as a whole. And one of the, the challenges that we face is to get students in particular, but also academics through what they teach, how they teach and how they assess to really make sure that all of those things are linked. It's structural because it's got to be integrated into the policies and practices of the institution. And part of those policies and practices are very much about training, support and resources. And unless you've got the training and support and resources, it doesn't matter how good the policy is, compliance with it and enactment to it uh, will be very difficult. And of course, it's political. Um, it's political in the, in the way that it's everybody's responsibility. And when academic integrity uh, starts to fall apart, it then becomes everybody's problem. So. I think we in universities, it's, it's great that we are, we are um, working in partnership. And I think that we have to continue to work in partnership with the multiple stakeholders. But also, I think that we've got to uh, engage in that old um, corollary. We've got to continue to learn by doing. And as we continue to learn by doing, uh, we need to be able to share the insights that we have so that more people can learn by doing and we can improve our practice. So that was my attempt to pull together uh, a diverse set of um, ideas, um, continuing to get seasick watching the chat, <laughs> the, chat <laughs> the chat screens rolling by and feeling deeply frustrated wanting to, um, to pick up some questions. So if I didn't pick up my question, uh, I apologize, but uh, others will be able to continue the dis discussion hopefully uh, at another time. So Jack, could I um, let you as chairman of Studiosity um, have the, the final word, but also to make an announcement that is an important announcement to the sector. Thank you, Judith, and thank you to the, the panel for that uh, incredible conversation. I think it's just a, a, a sign of how important this topic is and how much uh, engagement uh, we've already seen. And I'm sure this conversation is going to continue uh, for weeks and months to come. Uh, but right now, I'd just like to um, make a brief announcement. Um, for everyone on, on, the, on the call. Um, and it's about Tracy Bretag, whose name has come up many times today. As I think most of us know, she was a professor at the University of South Australia and a leading investigator in the field of academic integrity. And she did lead a major Australian study entitled Contract Cheating and Assessment Design. And she spoke widely on the importance of universities taking a very strong stand regarding educating their students about academic integrity and enforcing the rules with vigor and strong sanctions. Without her important contribution, it's unlikely we would be here today exploring the implications of Australia's aggressive new academic integrity legislation. Over the last few years, I got to know Tracy professionally. She was a keynote speaker at our 2018 symposium, and I attended one of the Texel workshops she gave around Australia last year. 
when I saw her at the end of last year in Adelaide, she gave me the shocking news that she'd been diagnosed with cancer and that her prognosis was poor. A few months ago, I wrote to celebrate with her when the legislation we've been discussing today passed the parliament. It then occurred to me that Tracy deserves to be remembered for her essential work in this field. So I wrote asking for her permission to create an annual academic integrity award named in her honor. On the 13th of September, she wrote back with typical humility, expressing her deep gratitude and full support for the idea. So with her blessing, we are moving ahead with planning for the inaugural Tracy Bretag Academic Integrity Award in 2021. On the 7th of October, Tracy passed away. So I'd like to close by saying we are all thinking of you, Tracy, and thank you for the work that you did that has brought us to this point on our collective journey. And thank you everyone for joining us today for this important conversation. And with that, I think we'll wrap up. Thank you, Jack. And um, can I thank the members of the panel, in particular those who are in the West Australia who are three hours behind, people who are in other parts of the, uh, yeah. the globe. Thanks, Judith. Uh, thank you for Thanks, uh, attending. Thanks. And the, the comments that we are, we're getting from people um, Clearly, we've hit a spot, and people have uh, are, are reacting very positively. So, thank you, everyone. Uh, have a safe holiday season, and let's hope that this time next year, we're not under lockdown in any way. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.